Hey there, it's Joe Johnson, host of Beetle Brunch. And as you know, on the Beetle Brunch YouTube channel, we bring you lots of uh, interviews and uh, what I call fab quarantining, things to do while we're waiting out the, uh, the coronavirus. And we appreciate uh, all of the guests that we've had on the show today. Uh, the guest that you're seeing in the, in the other window there that I'm about to introduce is a man I met 20 years ago. I can't believe when your book came out in, uh, in 2000, which I still have my signed copy. I was looking at today, The Beatles and Rishi Kesh. Uh, cool. It might be backwards to the viewer. Um, no, it's later, fun. oh, it was front. Okay, good. Later became the Beatles in India, and it was about your incredible uh, time that you spent in Rishikesh at the ashram, where the Beatles were. And uh, you have a new film about it now called Meeting the Beatles in India. But I want to introduce this incredible man. He's a filmmaker. He's a writer, a producer, uh, an actor, and uh, a voiceover. I mean, you, you've done everything: a director, a producer. And uh, you mainly started in film, and you kind of uh, lucked into this situation with uh, meeting the Beatles, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today, which is uh, part of the film, uh, Meeting the Beatles in India. It's Paul Saltzman. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well, and uh, it's lovely seeing you again. It's been a while. <laughs> I think we met at the, at the then called the Beatle Fest in New Jersey, or maybe the Chicago, maybe both, when you um, came out with your book, The Beatles and Rishikesh. And... Uh, we want, I want to talk about the film, but give us a little background first, uh, Paul, about um, the reason that you put out the, the book in the first place. And uh, I know I've watched the film uh, and it's magnificent and I, I'm going to encourage everybody to watch it online or if there's an opportunity to see it at a theater where you live, it's uh, Meeting the Beatles in India. And uh, I wanted you to say how it all happened for you. And I know you talk about it in the movie, but for somebody just watching you for the first time. Yeah. The short version of it is that I thought everything in my life was going really well. I was 23 years old. I was working for the National Film Board of Canada in Montreal. Um, I dated. I had been the host of my own, co-host of my own television show. I'd been a civil rights worker in Mississippi in 1965. I felt good about myself. I felt proud of how I was living. And I woke up one morning and I literally had a shocking thought that there were parts of myself I didn't like. And it was shocking because I wasn't really that conscious, a young man, not really. Um, and um, I sat up on the edge of my bed and without thinking, which is a key, you know, the, as, as I've said with some, some of my work, you know, this, this is a great computer we have in the head. It's a shitty guidance system. The heart is a shitty computer. It's a great guidance system. Mm -hmm. In fact, I did some, I've done a lot of work in consciousness to raise consciousness, meaning to raise awareness, to live better, to live more joyfully, all the things that we say we want, which we get, we get if we pay attention to it. And, um, you know, I, I, I had learned subsequently that the best way to live is to integrate the head and the heart, right? Makes sense. So I wake up this morning in Montreal and I'm 23 and I have this shocking thought and I, I literally put my legs over the edge of the bed, swung my legs over the edge of the bed and I said without thinking, what do I do about this? Out loud, just came out, it was weird. And I hear my soul talk to me for the first time in my life and I've been brought up to believe there's no God, no soul, no spirit. My folks were... Uh, taught me social consciousness, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you as their main teaching. Um, but, you know, they didn't believe in divine presence. And I hear this voice inside me, deep, all loving, all reassuring, just incredible. And it says, well, Paul, if you really want to look at yourself more clearly, you might want to get away from the environment you grew up in. And I say out loud without thinking, this odd conversation, Joe, I say out loud, where do I go? And that inner voice says, India. That's the end of the conversation. The next time I heard that voice was when I was sitting down with the Beatles at the ashram in Rishikesh. So I went to India because that's what I, my inner self, my inner self said. And I got a letter from my girlfriend. Uh, she didn't want me to leave. I didn't want to leave her. We both cried. And then I got a letter from her what, six weeks later saying, Dear Paul, I've moved in with Henry. Wow. And I was devastated. I was shattered. And somebody said, why don't you try meditation for the heartbreak? So I, I went to the ashram. I had no idea the Beatles were even in India. 
And I get to the gate of the ashram and I say, I've come to earn meditation. And the nice young man says, I'm sorry. The ashram's closed because the Beatles and their wives are here. So it really, their music had already changed my life, but it was not good news that they were there because I was suffering and I couldn't get in. Right, right, right. So you That's waited uh, You waited eight days and they finally invited you in. But, uh, but you knew the Beatles were there and you felt that that was the reason they weren't letting you in and you thought, hopeless you're going to end up getting turned away or you're going to run out of time right yeah well and in fact he said i'm sorry the ashram is closed because the beatles and their wives are here and uh, and i said can i wait and it wasn't to meet them it was like i didn't know what to do for the suffering right was it no while idea. you were there to work on that film because you mentioned in the uh in the film uh, meeting the beatles in india that you learned sounds so that you could be on the film crew of that right. film and get get to uh, India. And that was it during that same trip that you um, you went to the ashram, like when the filming wrapped? Same trip, yeah. Right. So um, what made you bring your camera and what made you, I mean, obviously we, we might not even be having this conversation if you hadn't brought your camera on that trip. I had a, I literally had a backpack. Mm -hmm. I was going, I was trying to find a different Paul, honestly. I was trying to find a different way of, I wasn't feeling good about myself, and I was trying to figure that out. You know, uh, the old phrase, in search of yourself, was really true, even though I wasn't thinking of it in those terms. But I thought, well, I'm going to go to India, and then I might keep going. So I had a backpack, and I had a camera, and I had uh, lots of film, um, and when I was with them and I said, do you mind if I take the odd picture? And they just, they just were so generous and took me into their group and said, sure. And I only took 54 pictures with anyone famous. I literally could have taken 254 yeah. Yeah. with anyone. I just didn't think about it. I took out my camera twice in the week I spent with them and I just didn't think about it. It's funny because now uh, I remember as a kid being really into photography and, you know, and not having a lot of money. So I'd buy maybe two rolls of film for my trip. And back then you go, okay, I only have three pictures left. Do I want to waste it on this guy? <laughs> so I, back then it was a lot different. I don't know if you brought a thousand rolls of film, but now with an iPhone or with a digital camera, it's like, you know, you can go forever. It's interesting because there's not a lot of photos of the Beatles uh, in India at that time, especially, and there are a few, but they're not anywhere near the quality of the pictures you took. So when you got home, did you develop them and look at them right away? Or did you just instantly put them away for? No, I, years? I put, I, I developed them right away. And I went to the Canadian national magazine because a, I was broke. I literally had no money. So I needed to make some money. I was blown away by the meditation. Like I knew nothing about meditation, mysticism. Right. India. When I went, I knew nothing. Duh. And the first meditation I did, which was half an hour long, and the agony of the heartbreak was gone. It was a miracle. So I came back thinking, I got to tell people about meditation. It's like, a, it's like a miracle. And in those, that period of time, of course, you know, 1968, meditation and yoga were very little known in the West. Now it's a rage and everyone's into it, or a lot of people are. Mindfulness, the word... The word didn't exist in our culture back then, mindfulness. So I wanted to say to people, whoa, there's this thing, meditation, it is a gift. And I needed to make money. So I went to the magazine. They wanted the Beatles pictures that, that pretty much nobody had. So that was a perfect arrangement. I got paid. I could tell people about meditation. They could have the story with the photographs. And that's after that I put them away. And I, I literally actually forgot about them for 32 years. And, you know, you've told the story in person and it's in the book as well. But we finally get to meet your daughter because she is the reason that the pictures came to light when they did. And she I guess you must have told her about that trip when she was a young girl. And she remembered and she kind of said, come on, Dad, bring them out. Right. It was very, very, you know, I like the word magic, Joe. Yeah. You know, to me, the meditation was magic. It healed a. Bro it didn't heal the broken heart. It took the agony of the broken heart away in one thirty-minute meditation. Mm -hmm. And what actually happened was she had moved in with Henry for whatever reason, and I was devastated. But after the first meditation, I came out of it in a state of bliss. Mm 
Hmm. Later, George Harrison said to me, I get higher meditating than I ever did on drugs. And I knew what he meant because I'd done drugs. And here I'd been done a meditation and it was like bliss. And in that bliss, I, I thought, well, if, Patri if Tricia is really happier with Henry than she is with me, I'm glad she's with him. And I really meant it. Right. That kind of love that's very expansive, not the normal kind of love that's very or can be very possessive. So the meditation was a miracle. I wanted to tell people. So I did the article in McLean's magazine. And then I didn't want to do anything more with the pictures. Literally decided I'm not going to do anything more with them. I didn't take them to do anything with them. I took them just hanging around. Like being, you and I were out on a picnic and you were taking pictures and I was taking pictures. We're not doing it to sell it. We're doing it because we're friends, right? Sure. So I put them away. And then, yeah, my daughter reminded me of them 32 years later from a childhood story that she only remembered vaguely. She said to me one day, she came into my study and she said, and didn't, in a quizzical voice, didn't you tell me you met the Beatles in India? She actually said, didn't you tell me when I was little, you met the <laughs> Beatles in India? And she was 16 and I said, yes. And she said, well, didn't you tell me you took pictures of them? And I said, yes. And it was like, duh, can I see them? And I had no idea where they were, no, no idea. So I found them. Right. It's great that you found them. Uh, let's talk about the film because the pictures are obviously um, kind of the glue that holds, uh, that puts the film together and other, other parts of that as well. But um, it, aside from the book, the film is kind of more about your journey. And in fact, you know, watching uh, Meeting the Beatles in India, the Beatles are players in the film, but it really is a, your journey and it really is your we get to see how you healed and, and what happened. And then if, as a bonus, we get these amazing intimate photographs, you know, John scratching his ear and the two, uh, Paul McCartney and George and John Lennon playing together, which we rarely got to see unless it was like an Ed Sullivan show or something like that. We really got to see them creating music together. And uh, I know you, you had to tell yourself, they're the Beatles, you know, what the heck? But then you had to say, but they're just people. and then. I think that allowed you to be less on guard and them to be less on guard. I mean, it's, I love how you describe in the film the intimate conversations you had with each of the four that were just organic, you know, and um, mm -hmm. with John, I, wa I want you to talk about, um, and I'd never heard this uh, interviewing you in the past when you were there to heal a broken heart. And you mentioned that to John, can you tell us about that conversation? Yeah, sure. And, and, um, you know, as hard as it is to, um, to understand or, you know, I mean, literally within 30 seconds of sitting down with them and we start joking with each other, the Beatles thing went away. I spent a week with them and I swear I never thought of them as the Beatles again after the first 30 seconds, just like, you know, now you're with people, right? Yeah. And I think that was part of why they were so intimate with me, because I truly didn't want anything from them. I, I had no intention to do anything with the photographs. I would have taken many more. I would have sold them. I had no intention. And yeah, one day we're sitting at the long table by the cliff overlooking the Ganges. The ashram was on a cliff, beautiful, overlooking the river. And we all would sit outside at this long table by the edge of the cliff with some shade over us and, you know, have chai and have sandwiches and eat and just kick around, hang around, talk when people weren't meditating or they weren't off in their case writing music and one and one day we're all sitting there and everyone gets up to leave except John and I and I'm sitting across from him and he's writing in his notebook and he's writing a song in his notebook and I'm not looking to read I'm just sitting with him we're hanging out and um, he puts his pen down and he looks up at me and he says in a very sweet voice he says so what are you doing here because no one was allowed in, right? And I wasn't sure. telling any story, I was just hanging. And I said, you know, meditation, heartbreak, miracle, the miracle of meditation. And he looked off into the distance, it was so very dear. I mean, with me, he was very dear. He, he looked off in the distance and he said, you know, he looked back then and he said, well, Paul, you know, love can be really tough on us sometimes, can't it? And I said, mm-hmm, yeah. And then he looked away again and he looked back and he said, but you know, Paul, the really great thing about love is you always get another chance. 
And in that moment, honestly, he couldn't have been kinder. He couldn't have sent something more hopeful to me because even though the agony of the heartbreak was gone, I still loved someone who wasn't available anymore, it would appear. And so that was very kind. And of course, later, I get back home to Canada and I read that he and Yoko have become an item and that he split from Cynthia. And I thought, aha, he was talking about both of us. Love, another chance at love. He was talking about both of us. Yeah, you guys talk about that. I know in, in addition to the Beatles being in the film and yourself, Mike Love of the Beach Boys and Donovan and uh, the wives and girlf or girlfriends of the Beatles were there. And I know in the film, um, Patty Boyd uh, is, is one of the interviews that you have. Right. Uh, and uh, Prudence Farrow was there. I've met her and she's told the story about the song a few times. But um, I wanted to, you to talk more a little bit about the film and, and, and what's it like for you? What was it like for you to create and recreate this journey? And for me, one of my favorite parts of it as well was uh, actually getting to hear um, Mark Lewison and you talk. Yeah. And he was, again, he was so natural and sweet and nice. I, I, and I feel like I know him already because I've read pretty much everything he's done a big student of his and yeah he was he was we we just got along like brothers i mean i'd never met i'd met mark once before at the beatles can uh week in liverpool um and it was just hi how are you nice yeah. to meet you i've heard of you that kind of stuff from both of us but um we got in touch with him he had never been to the ashram he had never been to india he'd always wanted to go so that was perfect we went with him to the ashram in india and as you saw, he and I talked in Mumbai. He showed well, Bombay then. It was called Bombay in 68, now Mumbai. And right. he took us to the EMI studios where George had recorded the instrument. His master's work. voice on the top of the yeah. His master's voice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then we went to the ashram together, rode the train up. And as you saw, we talked on the train. Mark is just magnificent. He's so humble and real and kind and and warm and gosh is he knowledgeable yeah. i mean i gather he's like the preeminent beatles historian probably the best there is yeah so that was really lovely to get to know mark and to film with him you know what i thought was interesting and and i wonder if you can give me an update uh you guys walked through the bungalows and the ashram and you were as best as you could recall pointing out you know who stayed in which one and they looked in pretty bad states of disrepair. Is there an opportunity for them to, I don't mean make it a tourist attraction, but bring it back and maybe reintroduce people yeah. to meditation there? Yeah, it fell into disrepair. The Maharishi and his people um, shifted their center of, of operations to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was, I think, in the early 70s, 73, 74. And the ashram really was in disrepair for a long, long time. It's jungle in a sense. I mean, it doesn't feel like you're in a jungle, but that's the vegetation. And finally, after one of the local newsmen, Raju Gusain, you remember there's that scene where we, he meets us at the gate of the ashram to welcome us. And that was a surprise, you know, it was a surprise. He was there with flowers and he put them around yeah. Mark's neck, my neck. It was very dear. And as I said in the film, you know, it's up to the, credit goes to Raju because he kept writing articles as a newsman and tell, saying to the government, you know, you should fix the ashram up. It's a historical site. So what they've done, and there's no plan to make it a tourist attraction, just a, you know, a small pea pilgrimage site. Uh, so they've, they've cleaned up the underbrush because it had grown over a bit. Um, there, they built a small uh, or a sort of long bungalow level. And one room is my exhibition of photographs that they asked if I would donate. And I said, great. Another room is about meditation, the Maharishi, the history of that. And then the third room is a little cafe where you can buy chai and sandwiches and stuff. I think they're going to next fix up the Maharishi's house, which really means just returning it to the state it was in, in the 60s, not to make anything fancy. I don't think they'll ever um, have like accommodations again, but it'll be a place to visit which isn't in disrepair. That's the plan anyway. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, my hobby as of about seven years ago, I call it my hobby because my work is filmmaking and writing and stuff, 
my hobby is I take small tour groups to India and we end up at the ashram. And the reason that happened was that when I was showing my pictures in Beetle Fest and gallery shows, I had, and I'm no, not kidding, Joe, there were maybe over the years, 50 to 100 people who said the exact same sentence to me. We're talking about Indi the Beatles and blah, blah, blah. And, and then eventually they would say, you know, I've always wanted to go to India, but it scares me. Mm. And I would say, why does it scare you? And they would say the poverty or the food or the heat or the whatever. And I would just say what my experience was. And one day a young man, it was the one Beatle Fest that Mark Lapidus did in Boston. Right. A young, man, a young man said to me at the end of one of these conversations, he said, I've always wanted to go into you, but it scares me. And when we finished having the conversation, he said, would you ever take anyone? And I said, what a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I designed, I designed a tour that would be a joy for me to lead, to take people to India. And we start in the deep south and we see a lot of India and we end up at the ashram. It's quite magical. Wow. We're talking with Paul Saltzman. He is the author of The Beatles in India, The Beatles in Rishikesh uh, books, but also uh, the director or the writer, the producer of uh, Meeting the Beatles in India, the film that has just come out. And I know as people are watching this, you, you've had a premiere, but uh, what is the best way for someone to see Meeting the Beatles in India? Could it be online or is it in person? What is it? Right, right now, because of the whole pandemic, it's only online. What, you know, who knows what's going to happen with the movie theaters. They'll reopen one day in the future. Mm -hmm. But if you want to see the film, you go to the website that it's being the platform that it's being shown on. So it's gather, G-A-T-H-R. There's no E, G-A-T-H-R dot com. And you'll see the film. You can also go to my website, which is the Beatles in India dot com. And there's a link there that'll take you to the same platform. So if it's easier to remember just the Beatles in India, dot com and they can find a an image to click on that'll take you to where you buy the ticket to see it so in the film uh you present most of your photographs do most of them make an appearance through the film i know the super famous oh. ones john and paul and, and ringo and george and you know the yeah there are in fact and this is quite fun there are 40 still pictures in the film that have never been seen before in film um, a bunch are mine but a bunch are other people's that I found. Um, I located uh, a woman in England whose mother had been one of the meditators at the ashram, and she allowed me to use some of her pictures, the one, any of the ones I wanted, and they had never been seen ever in a film or television. But the other thing that was quite exciting was that I, through an intermediary, in fact, my Indian production manager said, I know somebody who may have some film of the Beatles at the ashram. Well, the film that's available, The Beatles at the Ashram, is mostly from Italian television in 1968. Mm -hmm. And she, she introduced me to a man whose father was a filmmaker who went to the ashram, who shot 35 millimeter. And, and there might have been an hour of footage, but all he could find was one minute and 33 seconds. So I have one minute and 33 <laughs> seconds in the film of George and John, um, of that about 20 seconds is only sound, he couldn't find the picture, but oh. about, about 40 seconds or more, 45 seconds or more, is George on camera and John on camera in film footage that literally had never been seen ever. His father shot it, his father made a film, nobody wanted to broadcast it, and it went and sat in a house for 50 years. Wow. So that was oh. thrilling find that footage. And George comes across so beautifully, and so does John. I mean, what amazing men they were. You know, I think just as a, as a viewer and as a study of the Beatles, I think they really did feel like they were protected from the mania of the fans. Because even during the White Album period, right after Sgt. Pepper, they were still getting asked, when are you going to get back together? And when there's video or film of John walking down New York City in 1977, or eight or nine, and people are yelling out, when are the Beatles getting back together? So I think they were so happy to be able to let their guard down. And as George points out at one point in your film, he says, you know, we're, we're here to meditate and to write music and to relax and to, and to go to meetings and we can be very productive. And as opposed to going to a recording session, going to do a BBC show, flying out to do a concert, meeting dignitaries, you know, 
like their mania job was even after the Beatles um, stopped touring they still were uh, forced to go to the Yellow Submarine premiere you know whatever they were doing stuff and and you really get this relaxed you know uh, feeling when you see the photographs and when you see film of them. When would the Beatles ever have had two months with nothing to do but take right. relax and Mark Lewison says you know they didn't they weren't going into the Apple office every day. They weren't going exactly. to nightclub every day. It's exactly what you were saying. They were in a, a calm, quiet, protected atmosphere. No visitors, vegetarian food, meditation. I mean, the body is singing, right? It's nice to think back to those times. And we, you know, unfortunately, it took a pandemic. But, you know, you have, I look in my neighborhood. Families are riding bikes together. I go for a walk every night with my wife. We pass other couples that we've never met in the neighborhood. So there is a little bit of a silver lining in, in what we're doing. And uh, I think that if somebody were to take the 88 minutes or two hours to watch your film online, whether they're watching the premiere or in the silence of their own home, I think it, it's a nice time to relax a little bit. Your takeaway from the film now, because if you pull back and look at it as a viewer, what, what do you see? What, what do you want people to see? Well, thank you. I mean, that's a great question. So my motivation in making it um, wasn't to make money, though I put, a, I put a lot of my savings into it, so I'd like to get that back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my motivation and my desire to make it, which I was wanting to make it for 15 years before it got done, was to really look at meditation and creativity and the inner journey because I learned about the inner journey from the Beatles, within you, without you. Turn off your mind and float downstream. You are not dying, you are not dying, going towards the light, the void. And I remember listening to that as a young man. So I was then 21. And I remember the moment that song finished, the first time I ever heard it, and I thought, what are they talking about? Inner journey, you know, turn off your mind, float downstream, you're not dying, the void, the shining. And that was my first curiosity about, is there an inner journey? So my motivation in making the film was to approach the question of, is there an inner journey? You know, I think I, I said in the film, you know, at some point right after hearing that song, like within weeks, I read something Christ had said. He said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And I read that and I think, what does that mean? Because if there's a kingdom of heaven within me, I want to know and I want to know how to get there. And John Lennon <laughs> says on the David Frost show, in the clip that we have in the film, exactly the same thing. He says, you know, just if you know, just give it a try. And, you know, if you want, how do you get there? So meditation is actually a very simple way to access one's own inner journey, the soul, divine presence. So my desire was to talk about meditation, creativity, what's the connection between them, which David Lynch addresses beautifully in the film, and, and in a sense, um, the inner journey, the mindfulness. So that's why I wanted to make it. Yeah. You know, I was at the David Lynch uh, event in, I think it was 2009 uh, in New York City. Um, did you get a chance to um, give the pictures or, or present any of your art and your photographs to Paul or Ringo? in the time since the, it's come out? Well, what happened was very interesting. I'm sitting in my home outside Toronto in, 19, in 2009, as you were saying, and the phone rings and a woman says, is this Paul Saltzman? Yes, the Paul Saltzman who was at the ashram in India. And I say, <laughs> yes, who's this? And, and I forget her name, but she says, this is so-and-so. I work for Paul McCartney. Paul asked me to phone you. I said, well, that's sweet. And she said, He's going to be doing this concert at the Radio City Music Hall. And the second last song he's going to sing is Cosmically Conscious. Yeah, He'd like to use your photos for the backdrop, for a slideshow at the back of the stage, filling the whole back of the stage. And I said, oh, that's great. And she said, could we, could we use them? And I said, for sure. And she says, how much will that be? And I this, said, this was I your chance. This was your chance to get your money back on this film. <laughs> well, wait till you wait till you hear this. And this is exactly word for word. I remember this conversation, Joe, word for word. How much will that be? And I say, nothing, gratis. And there's silence on the other end of the phone. I mean, silence, silence, 
Sigh. She doesn't know what to say. Wow. And it goes on for five seconds, which is a long time. And finally, I say, why are you so surprised? And she says, this has never happened before. And I said, what do you mean? And she says, well, when people know it's Paul McCartney, they want a lot of money. And I said, well, I don't want anything because without their generosity, I wouldn't have these pictures. So there's no charge. I said, but there's one condition. And she said, what's that? And I said that you give me a copy of the slideshow you create from my pictures, just from my archive. And she said, sure, great. I wasn't there in New York. They offered me two tickets. And of all crazy things, I had a film screening somewhere else in America. And as much as I wanted to be in New York, I couldn't go. I couldn't go without breaking the commitment I had. Yeah. And Ringo, I got a call from Mark Hudson when Mark Hudson was still with Ringo. And uh, Mark said, um, I just took Ringo to see your first show in Soho at a gallery. And I said, oh, cool. And Mark said, he loves your pictures. And I said, great. And he said, he'd like one of them. And I said, he can have one or all of them at whatever size he wants for free, because I wouldn't, I said, same thing. I wouldn't have them without the generosity of the four of them. He said, no, he only wants one, the one with the narrow jacket. And I said, great. And we figured out what size. And I said, but there's one condition. <laughs> and, and he said, what's that? I said that I come and give it to him and you take a picture of me because I have no pictures of me with the Beatles because I just didn't think of asking, right? So I met Ringo in New York and Mark Hudson took a picture of us together as I gave him the picture. And that was very dear seeing him again. Is this the picture, by the way? No, it's not. That's, that's called... Um, that's called When I'm 64, the one with the um, narrow jacket on. All right, I'll try to find it while you tell us, tell it while you tell us more about the movie here. Hang on, I've got, uh, you probably know what page it's on. The movie is 82 minutes. Um, it's got wonderful people in it. I did ask the Beatles and Apple if they would do the film with me and they said, no, thank you. They don't do many projects with outside people and when they do, they tend to be very famous, you know. Right, Martin right. Scott or Peter Jackson or um, Ron Howard. So they declined. So I couldn't interview Paul or Ringo, even though, like I said, Paul wanted my pictures. And when Ringo was inducted into the Grammy, the Hall of Fame, his people called and said, can we have some of your pictures for the Grammy Museum? And I said, sure. So yeah, that's the one that Ringo wanted right there. I got to present it to him and Mark took a picture. So I have a current picture of me with Ringo. Fantastic. Wow. And is this book still available or did you, made a, you made an upgraded version that has uh, limited edition? Yeah. There's two other things. See, that book, which was done by Penguin Putnam in 2000, um, with all due respect, they really botched the printing. They mm -hmm. chose the wrong paper. It absorbed the ink of the pictures. So the photographs, the book is beautifully designed. And you can get it online, I'm sure, eBay and all that. Um, and I have some left if somebody wants to write me through my website. I don't advertise it because it's an older book. But what happened was that when that happened, I thought, well, one day I'm going to do it myself and do it right because the pictures didn't, don't look good in that book. Mm -hmm. You know, George's face is dark. There's no detail on one picture. Well, it's in the, the photographs are quite revealing, all the details there. So then in 2005, I came out with the limited edition books, which I paid for myself. I found enough money to make them myself, to so pay for myself, because I learned if you pay for it, you get to call the shots. Sure. If you don't pay for it, somebody can make a mistake like was done on the first book. So the limited edition books are available on my website. But then in 2018, on the 50th anniversary, Insight Editions in California came out with a 50th anniversary book that's about $40, $45. And it again is printed brilliantly. It's printed beautifully. And there's a new introduction in that book by Patty Boyd and uh, a forward by Donovan and so on. Yeah, the picture, and, and I, I actually got from you one time is a framed uh, photo of the one of uh, Paul and John together, which is uh, in my hallway right behind the store here. So, well, the film is called um, Meeting the Beatles in India. Paul Saltzman is the photographer, uh, the filmmaker, the director, the producer. And I can't believe we didn't mention March with the Penguins. Uh, yeah, Morgan Freeman was Morgan very kind. He did the 
He did the uh, opening narration, uh, um, and then he did the closing little right. piece of narration or setting up the closing of the film, and that was really lovely. I mean, he's got hello, the most perfect voice. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm, I'm the radio guy here. No, just kidding. I could never com com compete with yeah, Orton. But you're a close second. <laughs> okay, I'll take that. Better to be second, at least I was in the race. All right, Paul Saltzman, uh, the Beatles in India. Dot com is a quick way, but the film company is G-A-T-H-R, Gather Films, so it gather.com. Uh, if you want to catch this movie, I recommend it. I, I've watched it, and it's, it's just beautifully done, and uh, you do great work. It's awesome reconnecting with you, my friend. And with you, Joe, and thank you very much.